Secretary of Transportation Christy Hall is responsible for leading the Department of Transportation for the state of South Carolina. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, even though we're the 26th largest state, the Department of Transportation, the state on highways is here is the fourth largest in the country. So it's a lot of responsibility. Secretary Hall has risen through the ranks of that organization and has done virtually everything I think there is to do there, which offers her a unique perspective on the board of the, uh, of the Transportation Department. She's a South Carolina native. She's a professional engineer. She's a graduate of Clemson. Go Tigers. So what we have here is a demonstration that in the state of South Carolina, Game Cox and Tigers can put aside their sports differences and work together at the highest level. So, um, Rodney Robbins is no stranger to this room. He's an attorney with the firm of Thurman, Kirchner, and Timmons. Timmons. Yep. He's been on our board. He's been on the Metro Chamber of Commerce board and led their infrastructure visioning task force. Somerville Dorchester Chamber, Berkeley Chamber, and a whole host of other awards and recognitions. Uh, also a South Carolina native, a graduate of USC and USC School of Law. Um, he also is here as the first congressional district commissioner on the Department of Transportation. And he also serves as vice chair of the commission and chairman of the audit committee. So, what about those guys? Yeah. Not sure how that audit, audit committee thing happened, but we got it. So just really quickly to set up this conversation, I'm going to do a this couple of random slides for Anna. this conversation. I'm going to ask a few questions. I know you all have any questions. I'm going to set up some and set up the conversation, and then we'll open it up to the floor for further conversation. So first, um, many of you that participated in the One Region two-year update last week may have seen the slide from that one consulting, but just to set up where we are in the Charleston region, we're 74th in terms of population in the country, but over the last five years, we've been 16th in terms of job growth. And if you crunch those numbers, 21% of all jobs created in the state of South Carolina over the last five years have been created in this three-county region. It's pretty impressive. That's driving economic growth for the Southeast, driving economic growth for the state of South Carolina. But as we all know, with that growth has come a lot of challenges, a lot of population growth has come with that job growth, and we know that traffic congestion and housing attainability is a huge problem, and that 81% of our workforce <coughs> travels alone in a car mm -hmm. to get to their work, and that's increasingly becoming a problem. Just one quick example, I-526 um, is beyond the capacity for which it was planned and built. <coughs> Um, and just a note for those of you that are also data geeks like me, by 2030 we'll get over a million population. So challenging now is going to get more challenging in the future. But with new funding that thankfully was approved last year, um, the Department of Transportation has a 10 year plan which has over 650 total projects and by my count, quick nose count, over 39 of those are in the Charleston region. I mean, I'd be completely accurate. A significant amount of work is going to be going on in our region over the next 10 years. Many people perceive that nothing is being done, but these are current projects listed on the DOT's website. A lot of you all are seeing lots of orange cones and orange barrels. A lot of work going on with all of interchange, 526 Love Country Corridor work, Mark Clark Expressway, which I'm sure we'll get to later. And the conversation, the court access to regular multiple projects in Berkeley. So that's just, we just wanted to do that to set the conversation up. Um, and from there, actually, Secretary, I'll do this to you in case you want to use that. Let me just open up with a couple of questions. So first, I want to, on behalf of the region, thank both of y'all for the work of you and your team for recently getting the Wando Bridge reopened ahead of schedule. Um, so the follow-on question, so thank you. The Thank follow up sir. question, of course, is is that an anomaly or is that something that we need to be worried about in the future? So, um, the uh, the Wando Bridge is actually the only bridge that we have in the state that's that's designed quite like that. We have one that's not exactly the same, but but similar to it. Let's see. Is that working? Nope. All right, Plan B. All right, so the the uh, the bridge, the 526 bridge over the Wando River, 
is the only bridge like that that's built in the state. <coughs> At the time when that was uh, implemented, it was an innovative design. Uh, other states use that design quite extensively if you travel to Florida. Uh, I have family in Florida and I go down there quite often and Florida has hundreds of bridges like that. So it's it's not a bad bridge So it's, and it's a safe bridge so rest assured there's no issues traveling on the bridge. Um, but that bridge does require special maintenance and that particular bridge we had been struggling with to be honest with you for quite a number of years with uh, water getting inside the bridge. The bridge is actually a hollow box on the inside. And so we'd been struggling trying to keep water out of the bridge over the last several years. Um, we've <coughs> moved forward with an aggressive plan, hopefully to uh, try to uh, alleviate any of those concerns and build redundancy into the bridge. So I'm confident in our repair plan for the bridge. We still have a lot of work to do, both on the eastbound and the westbound structure to, to really kind of get, um, get that redundancy built in that, that we're looking for for those structures. Kind of a seat um, belt and suspenders approach on uh, safety for those two bridges. So I have no concerns about those bridges from a structural standpoint, from a safety standpoint. I think if we have any challenges with those bridges, it's going to be the capacity issue that you referenced earlier in your slide. Statewide though, we have <coughs> roughly about 8% of our total bridges in the state are in some form of structural deficiency. So what that means is, is that there's one element, one or more element of that bridge that's being monitored for structural sufficiency. If the bridge is unsafe, we will close them. No questions asked. We have 20 bridges currently closed in the state for various reasons but we have 8,400 bridges in the state that are open with only about, uh, like I said, about 8% that we're monitoring on a 12-month basis going forward. Part of the beauty in the gas tax increase was we recommended to the Commission and the Commission adopted a strategic and performance <coughs> management approach just like I heard you guys talking about on your me metrics for measuring success. We implemented that two years ago and laid out a vision for if more, if more money came to DOT, here's how we would invest it. And uh, bridges in particular was one of those elements, one of four major elements that we wanted to target the new funding towards. And so we have a strategic plan and a vision, a 10 year vision uh, and plan to dramatically decrease the number of structurally deficient bridges in our state our goal is to, to eliminate all what we call load restricted bridges and those are the bridges that really affect commerce in the state. Uh, those are the bridges that are load posted, you know, vehicle over so many tons can't cross. A lot of times there's a lot of uh, reroute for the movement of freight across the state because of those bridges. Fire service is often altered so sometimes you see your insurance rates go up because a fire truck can't use it, school buses, those type things. Um, so we've got a strategic plan to drive that number to zero. Currently about 350 of those bridges across the state. And then we're going to target the um, structurally deficient bridges on our major highways in the state. Again, looking at it from that economic um, standpoint, from the logistics of movement of, of freight all across our state. So, so we've got a plan. We're going to execute it. We're well underway. Um, we've got 51 bridges under contract today that uh, we're currently constructing across the state. Wow. So that's, that's we just segued right into kind of the second question is you have a 10 year plan, you have funding. Um, talk a little bit more, more about the success of year one. You can maybe expand on that a little bit and then we'll kind of talk about additional funding needs or unmet needs after that. Yeah, that's great. And um, so let me grab your little remote here because I, I will take advantage of this opportunity for sure <laughs> to get our message out. Um, 2018 was a record-breaking year for DOT. It is a record-breaking year from numerous standpoints, but probably the biggest is we have put that tax money to work. We have put the contracts out on the street. We are currently at the highest volume of road work in our state in the history of the South Carolina DOT. We went from about a billion dollar program to three billion dollars of road work that's currently under contract and underway. All those orange cones 
every single county of the state has some level of construction work that's happening today because of the gas tax that was increased just last year. Um, a tripling of our program, huge, huge, huge goal of our agency is to make sure that we're putting those dollars to work as quickly as we can in, in conformity with the priorities that we've identified. We said we were going to invest it this way. That's exactly what we've done. We've targeted four major programs and those, those programs are first and foremost safety, making sure that we address that. We have the highest fatality rate in the nation. Number one. I like Clemson football a lot and I love being number one in football. Sorry about that. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> He'll have an opportunity you, you, for rebuttal. You got it. Payback. <laughs> you got it. But number one in this category is not something that we like. And so, um, <laughs> because it's people's lives. People's lives we're talking about here. So, trying to drive down and develop a program to, to drive down that fatality rate in our state was our top priority. So we said last year, if you provide more funding, we're going to make a significant investment in safety. We presented that to our commission. Our commission embraced it. We moved forward. Our plan was to, to put forward 100 um, miles of work on that safety program a year. We're actually, as of today, we have 187 miles, so a near doubling of, of our original target uh, based on the actuals as of today. So that was our number one priority. Our next priority was going to be pavements, resurfacing, paving projects. Fourth largest highway system in the nation, but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of our roads in the state are in poor condition. We have dug ourselves a hole that's so deep, it's 30 years of decay, that I'm sorry, we can't turn that around overnight. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a plan. It's going to take a strategic vision. It's going to take a a period of, of investment over many, many years to turn that system around. I'm glad to report we just provided an update to the Commission last week that uh, we have our first year under our belt. About 2,200 miles of roads resurfaced in our state or uh, put out the contract already. The Commission just approved an additional 600 miles of resurfacing work including <coughs> projects in this area that will move forward over the next year. And we are seeing an up to 5% change in, in condition in the positive direction on the network because of that investment. So we're, we've finally gone from this direction to this direction on system, um, on, on pavement conditions. Next priority was our bridges. Just like I mentioned, our strategic vision on targeting certain elements of our bridge network to make sure that we're putting the money and getting the maximum value out of it when it comes to lifting up that economic prosperity of our state and servicing the communities that we all live in. And then last but not least is the interstate widening program. The projects that we are doing today and the projects that we're talking about doing today, we should have done 10 years ago. Easily should have done them 10 years ago. And um, we've, we've adopted an aggressive program of doing about 140 miles worth of interstate widening in our state, which will represent almost a, a more than a tripling of our interstate program over time. A minimum, a minimum of $5 billion invested on interstate system in our state, which is an astronomical number for DOT um, compared to historical numbers. I said a tripling. That's, that's for real. It's hard to believe um, being the engineer in the agency, but that's where we are today. Out of that $5 billion program, we have, as of today, $1 billion worth of work actually under construction on the interstate system today with much, much more to come. Between now and the end of next calendar year, the large, single largest project in our history will go under contract, and that's the Carolina Crossroads or Malfunction Junction in Columbia area. That one project by itself will be a $1.5 billion project. And then right on the heels of that are our plans to move forward with a widening of 526 down in this area. Existing 526. Sorry about that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I need to make sure I clarified. Um, but existing 526 from DOT's plan. Um, so we've moved out. We developed those priorities. We haven't wavered one bit in those priorities from what we said we were going to do, contrary to some 
uh, internet rumors that I've seen and heard, uh, but, but we have invested the money exactly the way that we said we were going to invest it. Um, we have hit and exceeded every single target that we laid out for ourselves, saying that uh, what we were going to achieve in year one. And we've done it in an analytical, not a political process. We try very, very hard and are successful at trying to keep politics out of projects that the DOT executes. Our commission provides us guidance at the high level on, on budget and performance metrics. In other words, we want to see the system improve by a certain percent over a certain time. And we rank projects using our analytical, non-political process and, and provide it to our commission to endorse, uh, to, to approve. But um, they don't pick projects and they don't <laughs> go in that project list and say move this project up or take this project out and put this project in. Um, this commission does not do that. So analytical, not political, and unfortunately, Commissioner, I know you get beat up for that, but it's, it's just simply not the case. And then the last thing, <laughs> another big push for us is transparency. Um, it, it's very hard for an engineering-based organization to de-engineer their description of, of, what, of what they're doing. Um, sometimes we provide too much information, too many details, and not really any good information. And so we've tried to revamp our web page. I would encourage you to follow us online, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Um, we've got an entire web section dedicated to the use of the new gas tax. What's come in, how it's been committed, what projects, if you want to see what projects are in your county, you can click on that area and it'll have a list of exactly what the projects are and how many miles and which program it falls under. So more to come, we'll continue to improve that as we go forward, but, uh, but we've, we've done exactly what we said we were going to do and we're committed to, to, do, to doing that long term. Well, thank you for that. Ronnie, you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I'd like to just jump in and, and talk to y'all about where the commission is at this point in our process. I was uh, put on the commission in March of 2016 and I believe you were made secretary two months before that in January of 16, is that right? The, the permanent, that would be the third time in the Well, you're right, yeah. We, we won't go through all the, all the disasters that you have presided over, but, uh, but she became the permanent secretary in January. I joined in March and uh, they were in the middle of the, of the most extensive legislative audit in the history of the state government at the time that I joined the commission. And uh, I won't go through that entire audit, but I want you all to know that there was no mismanagement of the DLT found during that audit. And that audit was a precursor to the Rhodes Bill that was passed uh, last year. And so there are a lot of people, I've, I've just endured two years of nothing but politics about the commission. And there are a lot of people out there that are misguided as to uh, what the commission is doing or has been doing and also uninformed about what the new legislation has done. But what Secretary Hall just told you is exactly uh, the deal. Uh, they have a 10-year plan. There are metrics to measure where they're going and we're in charge of all of that. So a lot of folks have this historical notion of the DOT and the commission in particular where the commissioners go around and, and find their buddies and pave their buddies roads and, and that's how it works. And, and that's, a, that's a time of the past. It doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, the legislation that was passed last year now puts us squarely in the purview of the governor of South Carolina. He appoints us and he can fire us. And so we work for the governor. Secretary Hall works for us. And, and we are serving now just like you are. We are a board of directors, basically, that oversees the department. We don't get in the day-to-day -day business of the department, but we help her shape policy and, and, and execute that policy. And we hold them accountable for what they do. And I can tell you in two years, a little over two years of being on the commission, this is the best DOT in, in the nation. There's no question in my mind about it. Uh, Christy, uh, despite her Clemson background, is wonderful, <laughs> and uh, I'm married to a tiger, so you can love tigers, this is possible, um, but uh, she is doing a phenomenal job, and I can tell you without, beyond a shadow of a doubt that that Rhodes Bill would not have passed 
but for the 10-year plan that she and her staff put together. They shared that plan with the legislature while the debates were going on, and they were confident in her ability to lead the agency, and they were confident in the plan that has been put together, and they have been working for a year now to implement that plan. plan. And uh, if you paid any attention to the Wando Bridge issue, I've never seen people work so hard to get something done. So I'm, I'm very confident as a member of the commission that we're in good hands. Right. Thank you, Robbie. That's all very positive news. We're very appreciative of all that. So huge lift to get that new funding passed. Many years, lots of hard work. Um, but we know that that money doesn't get us to excellent, right? That's safety and repair, and as you said, Secretary Hall, uh, repairing 30 years of the clock. So what, it's a multi-part question, I'll start with you, Robbie. What's the appetite um, at the General Assembly to take another run at additional funding? And then, um, Secretary Hall, if you will kind of follow on with it, what are the unmet needs you have and what are those priorities? Well, it's hard to say what the appetite may be at any given point, but I know that they recognize that what they did is only a, a first step. I, I think they've got that message. Uh, when that next step is taken and, and what it looks like, I think is still something that, that folks are discussing and, um, and, and trying to figure out. But uh, uh, those of you who are in the room who were part of the process know that we, we gave them several different uh, levels of investment that they could make and this is the outcome you'll get for each one and and we're, we're just not there from an overall system standpoint yet. Yep. Christine, if you want to add on to if you had more money what would you do with it and how would you prioritize it? Yeah, I, I'm sure that the folks sitting in this room when you looked at that list of four priorities there's some glaring omissions especially for this region widening of non-interstates is, is basically an unfunded need that we still have across the state. Um, so that's, that's a big gap that we have. Um, some other big gaps are uh, we really need to increase our, our uh, freight program for the state to try to target those non-urban uh, sections of interstate so that we have good connectivity. Um, the I-95 corridor, portions, uh, good portions of it, and certainly I-26. I would like to see that uh, widened as well. Uh, so we have that. Uh, more bridge investments would always be a good thing for us. And uh, it's not very popular in the General Assembly, but I do believe that we have to start thinking differently about how we move people in the state. And regions like Charleston, uh, I believe, is, is ready for uh, uh, the next level of transit uh, for the state. And I believe Charleston could lead the way in that as uh, demonstrated by the proposed BRT line for the region. Uh, we obviously want to see that succeed and uh, I'm personally very much engaged in that project with the, uh, some of our local partners down here to see what we could do to, to help move the needle forward. So um, safety, there's no, never a bad investment in safety, but what you hear me publicly talking about this 10-year plan will do is get us to a state of good repair or at least get us on that, that glide path towards a state of good repair. It will not address all the growth issues that we have in the state and some of those other um, congestion related issues across the state. So I believe my mission right now besides delivering the program as we outlined is to make sure that we're demonstrating that we can get the job done and we have to build confidence that yes we've got a plan but it's all about delivery. And if we can deliver what we said we're going to deliver and do it in an expedited way, just like we've dem demonstrated for the first year, that we can continue to build the confidence by our, within our policymakers that, number one, we say what we're going to do, and we mean it, and that we're able to deliver uh, what we said we're going to do. And so if we can get that part done on our part and then craft what the next priorities would be, I, th I think there would be some, um, I think the conversation would be a lot easier for us. We haven't had that credibility in the past. Got it. Yeah, we, we didn't really talk about how many different programs are either in early engineering, pilot program, or planning stage at the COG with the support of the DOT as well as the Federal Highway Administration, but bus rapid transit, um, potential for managed lanes, 
express buses tied into the bus rapid transit, um, and including a low country go pilot program that's rolled out here that is encouraging people to ride share, van pool, telecommute, consider other ways to commute. So all of that is going on right now, but it will be a while before that comes on online. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll open it up to everybody and, and with y'all. So um, again, back to the timeliness of the State Infrastructure Bank meeting yesterday. Um, Robbie, maybe we'll start with you on that one. Um, I won't phrase it the way Brent asked me to phrase the question. <laughs> uh, but what, what's your reaction to that decision, and what do you think the future holds for the possibility of 526? Is that, is that um, never going to happen? Is that going to happen sometime in the future? What's your best guess, and what's your perspective on that as a commissioner? Okay. And before I answer that question, I want you all to understand that this is my perspective only. I'm not speaking for Chairman Davis or any other members of the commission. And before I answer the question, I want to also say that if we didn't have the local option sales tax initiatives in the three counties here in our region, we would be in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, Secretary just mentioned that there is no non-interstate widening program. So the work that we have done locally uh, between our government and our citizens has been critical uh, to allowing a number of uh, roads to be widened or to be improved that otherwise would not be. So I wanted to get that in. Now to the 526 Mark Clark extension issue. Um, I was personally a little disappointed at the uh, level of discourse yesterday, but I was not um, shocked by the decision that they reached. Um, I, I wish it would have been otherwise, uh, as many of you in this room do, probably everybody in this room does, uh, but it, it didn't surprise me given the, the way the bank board has been going for some time now. Uh, I am hopeful that uh, Governor McMaster, now that he is the Republican nominee, uh, we'll take the opportunity in the next uh, month or two before the, the campaign gets hot and heavy again to hopefully sit down with uh, the bank board and the county and see what, uh, what they can do to, to resolve this. But uh, I really don't know what uh, the future holds at this point. I know what the county's position is and I know what the bank board's position is and uh, hopefully we can get something resolved because it is, it is desperately needed. So I'll just add a, a few comments to that. Um, well said, Commissioner. Um, this project's going to happen at some point in time. It, it's, uh, it's a matter of when, at this, in my opinion, currently. It's, it's a well-planned project. It's been on the bo books for a long time. It's not dissimilar from some other large projects, large capital projects that we've had when it comes to infrastructure. Um, as a matter of fact, yesterday, uh, after the SIB meeting, I was scratching my head a little bit and, and trying to uh, figure out exactly what happened, uh, whether it was a personality conflict that, that w we saw on display yesterday or, f or if it was uh, uh, something else. And uh, I couldn't help but think back to the Ravenel Bridge project and all the anxiety over getting that project funded and the creation of the infrastructure bank, which was to fund yeah. that particular project, that was that was what started the infrastructure bank, was to fund that large capital project that was really beyond the reach of everybody else to do individually. If you take the value that the Ravenel Bridge was in that year and add inflation to it and figure out what, what's that cost today, it happens to be almost identical to the cost estimate that we have for the Mark Clark Extension Project. So, yes, and it's, yes, it's an expensive project, but all projects are expensive now. And I think what we're seeing is just um, the realization that road projects cost an incredible amount of money, and there's just no way to get there. Any, no one, no one group can get there by themselves. It's got to be a collaborative effort. Um, I would encourage y'all not to underestimate um, the resolve of the governor. Um, he spent a great deal of time down here in, in the Charleston region, the Mount Pleasant region, with me when the Wando Bridge was out. He called me almost daily for updates. He reached out to me almost daily 
looking for what can I do to help you secretary what resources do you need uh, what can we do do I need to call Washington do I you know what other state assets do you need so he is he is a man of the people and he demonstrated that to me during the Wando Bridge issue for us and I believe that 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 truly did bring to light to him that how critical infrastructure is for a region and how mobility is severely impacted in an area uh, sometimes unexpectedly sometimes just due to growth so don't underestimate the governor uh, in his resolve on that I look forward to whatever role the DOT can play in trying to help mediate if there is a compromise that can be found we're the project managers um, we're the experts on the technical side and um, like I said, I, I think it's a project that'll happen at some point in time. Thank you. So one last question. Um, so you've got a pretty strong leadership room here. You've got folks from public sector, private sector, academic. If you left them with one, maybe two thoughts on how can they work to ensure with you that we're addressing our current needs as well as our future challenges, what would be the, what would be the message you'd leave for this group? There you go first. Mm -hmm. We need you, uh, is, is the message from, from me. Uh, I want to thank Brian Derryberry and the Chamber of Commerce for the hard work they did uh, with respect to the Rhodes Bill and with respect to the Mark Clark debate that went on yesterday. They really got engaged and uh, former Representative Limehouse uh, really cited that uh, when he was speaking of all the letters that came from the business community and he had them in his hand he was holding them up uh, and and he said this is the who's who of the Charleston community speaking to you guys today and and that's what we need if y'all remember during the Rhodes uh, debates that went on there was a lot of momentum for doing something but I really think the the, the tide turned when the Michelin CEO said if we don't improve the roads I'm gonna have to look elsewhere to do my business and, and so, uh, we need y'all to get out of your comfort zones and to and to get engaged because the business community has got to lead in this area for us uh, and and demonstrate to the general public uh, how badly we need this connectivity and this infrastructure that Mayor Tecklenburg talked about yesterday and I think you've got a general public right now that's very engaged because my DOT phone is very engaged. <laughs> um, the, the public's ready to go, uh, but I think from a, from a political standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, we need the business community uh, to help us. Yeah, just uh, again, thank you for what you did. Uh, it, I get a lot of credit for leading the way during the Rhodes Bill debate, but I was only one player in that whole uh, initiative. You guys were out there advocating long before I became secretary, and so I just want to thank you for that. Um, I can assure you and pledge to you that, that we're going to live up to your expectations. We made a promise to y'all that um, we're going to deliver this program and we're going to do it in the way that we say we're going to do it and we're going to do it in a transparent way and hopefully I was able to articulate that in some of the, the graphics for you today. Um, so I hope that you take away today that DOT is delivering, that we deliver. Uh, that's, that's really the, the main message that I'm looking to, uh, to broadcast across the state. And we're very receptive to suggestions, ideas. If you think we're missing something, if you want us to have more forums in the area, let us know. Um, we're all ears about that because we feel like we're all in this together. This isn't just the DOT's responsibility going forward, nor just the local government's responsibility, but we're all in this together. So we pledge to work with you and work for you and uh, make you proud and just thank you again for what you've done for the state. Thank, thank you. you.